back and good evening if you've just joined us. This is Africa News Network First Fast Live on DSTV Channel 45. My name is Cindy Mabi and this is our top story this hour. Danal refutes any notion of capture in the state-owned arms manufacturer. The company's top executives make the statement during a portfolio committee meeting on public enterprises today. And former finance minister Praveen Gordon hurled a volley of cha charges against Danal without prov providing facts to back them. Gordon alleged that changes in the Danal board and executives is a pattern and accuse the entity of being compromised. He alleged that changes are made in the board by suspending some executives and replacing them with compliant people. But in doing so, Godan fails to prove irregularity by the new appointees before questioning the integrity of Danal. He challenged Danal to demonstrate that it's not serving the interests of certain families, but is it fair for the former minister to make wild allegations when the Treasury, even under him, could not prove anything? Also, shouldn't Godan point out illegalities in the Danal VR laser deal instead of target targeting businesses at the Portfolio Committee meeting. The, the perception of capture is going to remain uh, in, in the public domain. Uh, we need to be convinced how is it that out of all the many entities that might be involved, uh, an entity that belongs to uh, a particular set of families is always the ones that we go to. Uh, and, ha and have to do business with. Dinell is not captured. Dinell is not captured by anyone. I think the concern which you must raise, on top of the concerns that you have raised, what role are we playing? Just going back to Honorable Yenge, that maybe it's not captured by Gupta. Maybe it's captured by Idlami. There was a thorough process by the former public protector to investigate if there is something wrong with this particular contract with VR Laser or any other contract. Um, the report, as it stands today, from the public protector did not make any adverse finding towards denial. There appeared to be an uh, agreement on the instruction of Mr. Kigawa that uh, the chair was instructed to withdraw Denel's High Court application. Is that true? Because what we're hearing today is that the High Court application is continuing. What the newspapers reported was that you were instructed to withdraw it. Even the statement from the spokesperson said that. The Minister of Finance obviously, um, due to his own concern, he called us. He wanted to understand from us why this impasse and how can this impasse can be resolved. You were instructed to deregister the Nail Asia. Is that true? You were instructed to dissolve the joint venture with VR Laser Asia. Is that true? We have satisfied ourselves as the board and the executives that the process which was followed in selecting the art laser South Africa was beyond scrutiny. There is no audit report that questions it. In our own due diligence process, as this noise started uh, bubbling in the air, there is nothing wrong in the process we formed. We have heeded to the call of this particular committee to say, whilst we are still engaging and looking at the legal framework you followed in establishing this particular business, don't trade. 
Well, Finance Minister Pravin Gordon says that there's a pattern to be seen in the way ESCOM and Danao boards have been operating. But analysts say it's Gordon as the member of Parliament's Oversight Committee on Public Enterprises who seem to be following a pattern. Pronouncing verdicts without giving an ear to the explanations offered by parties being targeted. Yesterday, Gordon dismissed ESCOM's explanations regarding Mulefe's reappointment as lacking credibility, despite ESCOM saying the decision was backed by legal advice. Minister's onslaught came without any evidence to back the claims. And Godan further surmised that the ESCOM board is abusing state property and resources, a statement that reeks of agenda as Treasury's probe in ESCOM ordered uh, during Godan's tenure is mired in controversy for being a hatched job. The minister alleged that uh, ESCOM's board is part of a conspiracy to capture ESCOM for the benefit of a few, but uh, this is not irresponsible for the ex-minister to repeat unverified allegations to implicate ESCOM. And furthermore, Godan did not question the big four mining companies fleecing of ESCOM over the years when he was at the helm of uh, uh, financial affairs. Increasingly, the public is aware of what you as the board of ESCOM are doing and not doing. They are increasingly aware that you are abusing state property and state resources in the name of yourselves, not in the name of the South African public. And joining us uh, in studio is Resitahi Khomu, uh, a political analyst. And we have uh, Jasmine Oppen, uh, Opperman, the uh, security expert. Good to have you. Thanks so much for your time. Jasmine, let's just start uh, with you. In terms of the importance of the VR laser deal and, uh, and uh, Denal, uh, that you know, there has been explanations there in court now to say nothing is untoward. How important is this deal when it comes to the uh, South African security? Uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, and good evening to the viewers. It is of utmost importance. South Africa has very specific legislation in terms of uh, arms sales and in terms of regulation of arms, um, not only in South Africa but on the African continent. And if there's one needs the nail to stand beyond any questionability when it comes to its credibility in selling of arms. So any deal that has been is being negotiated with them is going to reflect an image of South Africa's actual intent in contributing to stability and peace on the African continent. And while on that confidence that uh, foreign investors uh, and trade partners need to have, what we're currently seeing in Parliament with the Portfolio Committee on Public Enterprises and the nuance and insinuations around corruption and capture of state, what impact does that have for the national image? It's having a tremendous negative in, uh, impact. There's already the issue of, of uh, from an economic perspective, the degrading uh, of South Africa's economy. Uh, when it comes to weapons and arms sales, there has already been questions in the past, for instance, in terms of weapons being sold to Rwanda, and the role Rwanda is playing in the region uh, adjacent to the DRC. So South Africa being seen as a leading country on the African continent as being seen as espousing democratic values, espousing democratic uh, institutions, we cannot afford at this point in time to have this also being questioned. All right, stay on the line, Jasmine. We have Resi Tahi Khomu, a political analyst. Good evening to you. Good, Good to evening. see you again. Mm -hmm. yes. It seems all and sundry have uh, thrown ESCOM board and Minister Lynn Brown under the bus. But is this becoming of uh, portfolio committee members today? From what we've seen, not necessarily direct questions as to the happenings in ESCOM uh, or Denal. It's more about uh, making statements or, you know, uh, suggesting that there is a, uh, a direct exploitation of state re resources and property. What do you well, make of it? Well, um, I've got an impression, and impression is simply that uh, it seems to be very opportunistic and prob probably political expedient mm -hmm. to actually the, just make a, a, a fleeting statement to say state capture without actually adducing evidence that support that view as well. So if you look at um, a situation at ESCOM, also the situation at Denel, one, one, one has got the difficulty in agree to the notion of state capture without the adduced evidence, without objective examination of all the facts that actually prove or disprove the existence thereof. I would like to therefore say that it is rather very dangerous 
for even our parliamentarians to actually make conclusive remarks or conclusions which are not informed by objective facts. It seems to me, therefore, that if you look at a company like Denel, and I would like to say I worked for Denel for eight years, from 1998 to 2006 with Pride, uh, 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 this is an entity which I would like to say is world-class in terms of the product that it produces. It is world-class in terms of institutional corporate governance. I would like to believe that based on their track record from the time they were incorporated, uh, which is 1 uh, April 1994, the company has always at all times upheld the highest possible level of corporate governance. It is therefore difficult to agree that it has suddenly then abandoned uh, the, the, the corporate governance architecture that it proudly upheld over the years. I would also like to say the same applies to ESCOM. Unless you can be able to produce objective evidence to say this is actually the situation, this is the, ex uh, the existence of corporate culture, then, the, then what, I mean corporate ca capture, then what I would like to say that is simply misplaced opportunistic and also disingenuous. All right, and uh, Jasmine, just the, the reiteration of perceptions about ESCOM and uh, Danel, and we know that the Court of Public Opinion, of course, uh, is, has got a particular narrative or lexicon. In your view, was the process fair to, to ESCOM in, in their response to questions from parliamentarians? Jasmine, can you hear me? All right, we'll have to go back to, to Jasmine in, in, in case some of our viewers weren't following the proceedings. Do you think it was fair on the part of the SOE? Uh, I think, uh, largely speaking, I would like to say there is a lot of politicking going on. And it some, seems to me that uh, there is nothing very objective because one would have to have a point of departure if you want to have an objective result of what you are examining. What we now have seen in terms of ESCOM and also today in terms of, of Denel is a simply a situation where they would like to actually, as far as possible, discredit the current management and the board. I would like to say in terms of Denel, which I worked for with Prime, one cannot be able to succeed in uh, damaging the integrity of the current board, of the previous board, or even the current management. As well, like Ntepe is the guy that I know very, very well. He's the acting CEO there. He's a man of integrity. The previous board and the current board, I would like to say, they are, in terms of the corporate governance architecture that has been adopted for many, many years since 1994, they cannot, under any circumstances, be seen to be, to, to, to be, to be, to, to be allowing a situation of corporate uh, capture of Denel at all. So, so then what do you make of uh, former finance minister Pravin Korda and then saying uh, to the Danau board they need to prove that they're not serving a particular family uh, and, by, and also disregarding Danau's response or submission uh, to, to the matter? It, it is very difficult to understand. This is the man who was the finance minister uh, in charge of national treasury for many, many years. Now suddenly is no more there in government, etc. So one wonders as to actually what is it that is driving his thinking now. I would like to believe that he should be having some information that attests to or that actually confirms the allegations that there is the capture of Denel. If he has, why does he not stand up and go and report that? We would like to hear what are those things that they say they amount to or constitute uh, uh, the capture of a company like Denel? The same can be said about ESCOM as well. So I would like to say that the ex-Minister of Finance is probably very bitter, using every available space to actually then get back at the people that he probably despised because of what happened in terms of his losing the cabinet portfolio. I don't believe that it is very genuine in terms of him articulating the position that he does because he cannot, and he has not up to this stage, be able to support with facts, with solid facts, what actually constitute capture of Denel or any of the SOEs.
Mm. Uh, Jasmine, I believe you're back with us. That's Jasmine Opperman. She is a security expert joining us uh, via uh, Skype or uh, outside broadcast. Jasmine, I mean, you know, even with the portfolio committee today, uh, members saying that connect the dots or uh, that there's prima facie evidence as per the state of capture report. But we know that that report in itself is still subject to a judicial uh, inquiry being being set up. So what do you make of these kind of remarks uh, that you, the board needs to prove their legitimacy or independence uh, and that they're not serving a one particular family? It, it is a fundamental concern. At the end of the day, if you look at our constitution and we talk about our chapter two institutions, they are and actually the upholders of our democratic values and, and what South Africa and South Africa's image is going to reflect to the outside. So when we start coming back home and we start seeing these questions being raised, um, these matters must be dealt with very quickly and appropriately according to fact, which I agree with. But the, the essence of the matter is, whereas there's an internal debate and an internal resolution at stake here, there's always also in the meantime an image being portrayed to the rest of the world. Like it or not, these perceptions are influential in terms of determining our our role in international uh, structures, our economic position, the, the investor confidence that is needed in South Africa. So when we start having these questions being raised and it's being linked to the now, which is at the core of arms sales, we are standing at the risk of losing credibility. And that issues by the portfolio community has to be dealt with as quickly as possible. Yeah, and the omission of, of looking at previous contracts and procurement uh, by Donnell and ESCOM of other players uh, with, uh, uh, you know, long-standing contracts. Why do you think that omission was made? Hi, Jasmine. All right, we're having some diffi technical difficulties mm. there. Maybe you can take that question. Well, well I would like to simply say that... Uh, up to this far, there hasn't been any shred of evidence that suggests the existence of corporate culture of Denel, in particular in this case. And there hasn't been also any evidence that supports the claim that Denel's contract that is now in question has broken any corporate governance rules. I've alluded earlier that uh, Denel has over the years from 1994 when it was incorporated as a, as a business entity, an offshoot from AMSCO to become an independent and commercially driven organization, they have always upheld high level of corporate governance to an extent that one would not agree that there has been any capture of any sort. One would also be bewildered to believe that Denel would enter into a contract that does not meet the basic or fundamental principle of go corporate governance, which they have mastered over the years, and they have always, in terms of uh, compliance with the company law, which is the, 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 the law that created it as a business entity, on the other hand, also complying with things like the PFMA, Public Finance Management Act, and also the Treasury regulations which are issued from time to time. I worked for Denel and I understand these things very, very well. Yeah. I understand how it worked, and therefore I have got serious difficulties with the people that make fleeting allegations without supporting that with evidence, or without standing up or waking up and go to report these things to the... If somebody has got a dossier, why don't they take it to the police, the hawks, or the NPA, or even to the judges if somebody doesn't believe in the current criminal justice system. Yeah, but in the interest of transformation, which is now the government imperative, why was there no question of the, uh, the big companies, or four major ones, who've had evergreen contracts uh, for, for a long uh, years and, and continue to do so? Well, one would have to look at this claim of corporate culture in perspective and in context. The, Context is that there is a regime change program going on in South Africa, we know about that. And in order to do that, you must discredit as far as possible the current administration of President Zuma and therefore ensure that you discredit all the people that are associated uh, with, with him so that you can be able to uh, plant the seeds for 
a fertile ground to have the government changed. I think that that, that is the, the, the situation. Uh, all these things that we hear about, there, there is no evidence, there will never be evidence after all. It simply is a situation where people say, how do we get at Zuma? How do we take him out? In order to take him out, you will have to create an atmosphere. You will have to create a climate that says he is not fit to rule. Therefore, we must then say he is attached to the Guptas. Yeah. And when there is no evidence of that sort that the Guptas are or have captured South Africa, there's no such a thing, it's actually nonsensical. So what do you make then of uh, former minister Praveen Gordon repeatedly saying people must connect the dots? Uh, it, it is this becoming of a member of parliament, as you're saying, that, you know, provide the solid evidence, you have access to resources to do so? Uh, this ex-minister of finance, I would like to believe, and that is the sense I have about him, that he is being driven by bitterness of having lost that portfolio. And he is, I think, also being motivated by certain things, probably connected to the regime changes. I wouldn't be able to know. I don't have the facts to allude to that. But it is very highly suspicious that there are certain things that are driving what he says. It has become now clearer and clearer, now that he has left the cabinet, as to where he is, why he is using this capture, very strong ways corporate capture, all that and all but that. But it's not in it, isolation. There are other voices that also speak of capture. And, you know, we're all trying to get uh, a more clarity and get to the, to the truth, as it were. So the, the connecting the dot is, is, has been a, a very popular phrase. And speaking of patterns, that, you know, mm -hmm, boards mm -hmm. are changed, executives are moved here and there to fulfill the aspirations of one particular family. What, what, what do you say well, to that? At the end of the day, it is an agenda to effect regime change. And we know there is that agenda. And, 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 and that agenda is being pushed by many people. I would not like to conclusively say that he is actively involved in that, but things suggest that he should be either agree with that or supporting that, that particular thing. I, I'm highly suspicious in terms of the utterances he makes today about the SOEs today without solid evidence that he can put forward to say, this is it. This amounts to the capture by the Guptas or specific families. He, he uses the word specific families, but we know who he is referring to. And we know why he is adamant that companies like uh, the, 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 um, the SABC, uh, uh, Denel, and, 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 and uh, and ESCOM also are, are, are being captured without actually having any evidence to substantiate. It is to create the bewilderment uh, uh, atmosphere in the country that says the country indeed is captured when there is no uh, evidence to substantiate. That very perception itself creates a be bewilderment that will bring about, hopefully for them, a regime change. All right, we're going to leave it there. Resi Tari Komu, as always, good to see you. He's a political analyst and on the line, Jasmine Opperman, a security expert. Uh, we do apologize for the technical difficulties we had in connecting with her. But on to other stories.